Hi everyone, it's my great uh, joy to introduce you to a very inspiring thinker uh, about the topic of posthumanism in relation to critical race studies, Philip Butler. So before we go into the conversation, I want to mention that Philip is here with us at NYU. First of all, thank you so much, Philip, for coming. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, it's so good to, to have you here. And Philip is actually one of our speakers at the next New York Posthuman Fall Summit that we're actually having tomorrow here at NYU. And Philip is going to uh, enlighten us about two specific topics. So we are going to have two conversations with Philip. The first one is uh, the, no, the topic of uh, black participation in posthuman discourse. And Philip has very interesting ideas on this, so please stay with us. And the second one is also very interesting, is actually the work that he's, uh, uh, Philip is developing at the moment. He's writing a book on this topic, which is Black Post and Transhumanism. Now, a little more about Philip. Philip Butler is a visiting assistant professor in the Theological Studies Department at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. His work primarily focuses on the intersection of neuroscience, technology, spirituality, and race. He is the author of Making Enhancement Equitable, a racial analysis of the term animal, human animal, actually we are going to talk about it now, right. and the inclusion of black bodies in human enhancement. Um, I highly recommend, I recommend you that article. I have it here printed. I'm going to talk more about it, but you need to read that because it's really, really good article. And he recently completed his first uh, book project entitled Black Transhuman Liberation Theology, Spirituality and Technology. I also want to mention that we have this uh, excellent, uh, visionary, beautiful artwork in the background that inspired uh, Philip and his work. So we really would like to mention that the artist is uh, art, art by Ancient, um, and his work can be found in Instagram. So again, thank you so much, Art by Ancient, for sharing your beautiful artwork. And uh, again, thank you so much, Philip, for being here with us today. I'm so excited. Looking forward to our discussion. Fantastic. So. Philip, uh, there is much uh, we want to cover with you. And again, I'm very excited to say that we are actually are going to have two interviews with Philip. So, you know, we have enough uh, time to really go into very um, to details. Uh, but the first uh, um, article that I would like to uh, reflect uh, with uh, Butler is the one that is entitled Making Enhancement Equitable, a rational analysis of the term human animal and the inclusion of black bodies in human enhancement. Eh? That was published by uh, Philip Butler in the Journal of Posthuman Studies in 2018. Now, this article is uh, again, um, has a very clear uh, argument. And the argument is that uh, something that is uh, very fashionable, I myself use this term, and that's why I'm very even more interested to hear uh, uh, more about uh, uh, Philip critique, because it's definitely a very brilliant critique, is the notion of uh, uh, human animal that has been used in the posthuman discourse to really uh, push the call for post-anthropocentrism. So the idea is, uh, um, again, posthumanism can be addressed as a posthumanism, as a post-anthropocentrism and a post-dualism. When we think of posthumanism as a post-anthropocentrism, we want to think of the human not uh, from a position of human, uh, not from a supremacist position uh, against other animals, but again uh, in, uh, in relation to uh, the biosphere, to uh, non-human animals, etc., etc. But Philip is a very good critique of this term. So uh, I want to hear more about it and again, uh, develop more a conversation on this topic uh, for everyone, but especially also for the posthuman uh, thinkers uh, that, uh, like me, uh, have been using this term. Uh, on one side, again, to try to be more comprehensive, but with the limits that Philip is going to address today with us. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your paper. Again, you should read it. If you're on academia.edu, uh, you can download it and, and very, very clear uh, uh, paper and argument. So, Philip, would you mind telling us more uh, uh, what brought you to, for instance, to the conclusion that we need to think critically about, the, you know, the notion of human animal, and what should we do about it? Sure. So, I, I'm, I was, I came into posthuman discourse just really excited about the idea of, of uh, hypersubjectivity, the idea that what our own personal locations as scholars, as individuals, as people within the biosphere or the Anthropocene or the larger cosmos is something that we can really kind of hone in on and understand and and, and be a place of, of, of that is respected and valued, but I was kind of I was kind of not necessarily thrown off, but I was curious as to why this uh, human and animal was kind of thrown back together again. And so, being a black man in the United States, and just kind of thinking about racial histories in the United States, I was 
a bit concerned by the term itself because uh, if we recognize, you know, one of the main critiques of humanism itself, the reason why posthumous comes around is because the idea is that wh there were only certain kinds of people that were human at one particular point. And so uh, the, the terminology of human or the place of human in society is new for black people, not to say that black people weren't acknowledging their own humanity, but being recognized and given the respect and the place in society as a human within society, we can also, we can argue that within maybe the, like the last 50 years, black people just kind of gained this, gained this space. But some people can argue that black people's humanity are still not respected until this day. And so, uh, not let alone the fact that, you know, we, we look at the foundations of our own kind of uh, sciences and, and, and the, the, the propping up of the term human uh, against large, larger dominant discourse has been done against either black or native bodies. And so when we talk about what is, a, what is an animal, what is a savage, what is a native, what is the other, uh, in many cases, it, the, those have all kind of looked and people who share similar lineages to myself. And so uh, one of the th main things I say in this article is that, you know, black people just became human. Why, why are we gonna add on the term animal back again? It's, it, it becomes a harmful turn. I almost say it's like a like biochemical <laughs> warfare because of the, the sharp responses that you could imagine that black people may have when they read this term and to suggest that post-humanism is, is inclusive, hyper subjective, and even kind of hyper relative, but uh, the naming of the, the, the human subject is done so in such a way that places uh, the humans uh, in, in the same category as animals in a way that it can almost read uh, as harmful. Uh, and so the idea is that if we move, if we take this term and we can, we lift it up and we recognize that it has harmful potential effects, then maybe it's important for us to begin thinking of different ways within post-humanist discourse to relay our message and, and kind of rethink about who we are or what we are. And so that's part of the reason why I propose the term the human entity, because the entity is, uh, I, I take this from uh, Whiteheadian discourse within process thought. And so everything at every level of scale functions as an entity. And so when anything comes in contact with another, we have events. And so these events are the very critical for our lives. They, they become the concrete versions of all the potentials for that could have existed. If we didn't meet today like we were talking about earlier, then we, we'd have another set of events that would uh, kind of lead our lives. But in, within these various events, we all function as entities. And so the idea is that an entity uh, allows for us to really, really be uh, decentering the human uh, in a way that places us in a very real way at, at the same level as everything that is in, that we can uh, kind of see or imagine within the universe itself. And so within this framework, we still have to, rec we, it gives us the capacity to decenter the human, but we also recognize that a human animal on, on the same scale is still looks at humans, or it looks at animals in relationship to humans, so this non-human animal, it could just be like, I think in the, in the paper I talk about, I had a Doberman at the time, uh, his name was Jeremy, it could be a, it could be a Doberman pincher entity, it's, and not necessarily talk about its animalities in it so much anymore, not to say that it's not an animal, but its entity-ness maybe would over, overarch it based upon the specificity of what it is, it's a Doberman pincher. We know it's a dog and we know it's an entity, and as an entity, when it comes to contact with me or anybody else, it creates its own events, which has its own kind of concrete uh, uh, past and, and potential futures as well. Thank you so much. And what is uh, uh, really uh, beautiful about uh, Philip work is that he is, uh, uh, I think, is very um, integral. He doesn't just give a critique, he offers a, a possible solution. And uh, so the, mm, I would like to go back again uh, to uh, the critique of uh, the notion of human animal and also mention again that, for instance, Philip's uh, proposal is uh, instead of using human animal, using, using human or non-human entities, which is again uh, a very interesting idea that we should really uh, reflect upon. Now, um, of course, you know, someone who is based in the United States knows about all the legal history of racism, scientific racism. Someone who is not based in the United States may still be very much aware of racism, but maybe less uh, knowledgeable about the way legally and intellectually and scientifically how, again, for instance, black bodies were dehumanized. Do you mind uh, telling a little more uh, the audience about examples of how this notion of animal has been connected in very racist way through science and, and laws in the history of the United States, but not only, eh? because again, this is something that we can also see in European thought. Sure. But if you don't mind giving again a little more examples for people who, who say, well, why is that an issue? No, I think that's totally fair. So, I mean, I think we can go maybe as far back as craniometry, right? Just a kind of real basic example. The idea of craniometry is you can suggest that based upon the, the, the skull size or the shape of a skull, 
that you could tell how far or involved in a particular human being was uh, at the time. But <laughs> and so the idea was that uh, folks of Asian descent had very large heads, supposedly be highly intellectual. People of European descent had had sizable heads, supposedly have a sizable intellect. But then this the idea was that uh, people of African descent had very small heads, and and so it was trying to juxtapose the idea of head size uh, to intellectual capacity. Now we've we've re we've we've since known that. Uh, most of the scientists that were engaging in this type of work were substituting actual animal, actual skull, actual animal skulls in 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 lieu of actual black skulls. Not to mention that when they talk about uh, intelligence and maybe criminality, uh, when we look at criminal brains uh, at post uh, post post uh, post mortem, their brains were very large. And so we can also look at people who who are supposedly had high intellectual capacities, but also had smaller brains all overall. And so uh, this was something that became debunked, became debunked over time, not to mention the idea that a certain, um, a certain med medical doctors were thinking about the idea that black people had different biological systems altogether. And so this is another example of scientific racism. But when we talk about this animality or this kind of the use of it, right? So um, I think I think one of uh, uh, one criti uh, the, the early critical theorists right in the Frankfurt School would talk about the ways in which science has its own kind of magic that is based upon the dissection and the, the barbarism right of 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 dissecting bodies right whether they be rats or, or human bodies but there's an e there's a very close uh, correlation between uh, 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 lab animals right and then what was what were lab animals at the time and so while now we have laws against you know um, dissecting or experimenting on humans before that the people that were, ex were were experimented on were black people and so when we even look at our human anatomy right now uh, Harriet Washington her book uh, medical apartheid gives us a very clear uh, history of that and I think a good example right is that uh, she gave a story of, of a medical doctor here in New York who kept a, a skeleton up in uh, in his in his room uh, you know in his classroom uh, you know uh, to give lectures based off of but that same skeleton actually came from a black body and so we talk about the arch the archetypes for our own biological systems as we kind of see uh, you know, in, in Western medicine, those same archetypes were based upon the animals and the dissections of black bodies who were not given the very same rights and, and, and privileges or even respect uh, that, that uh, the European bodies were given or Western European descending bodies were given uh, throughout history. And so I think, and so this is just kind of medical stuff in terms of laws. You, you keep, uh, we, we go through reconstruction period and the, the blowback on that. Uh, we have Jim Crow and so forth, and so housing laws, all these kind of variations, and then we and we talk mass incarceration and what it looks like today, uh, prison to, uh, uh, the, um, you know, the prison to uh, um, the, the classroom prison pipeline, and so uh, there, there are various ways in which people attempt to utilize black bodies again as kind of the fodder for for capitalistic frameworks that promote uh, kind of normalcy in terms of keeping uh, certain folks ahead while particularly preying upon folks who are black, brown, and who are, and have been historically disproportionately um, uh, discriminated, discriminated against. Absolutely. And uh, again, again, in the field of bioethics, also interesting the case of the cells of Henrietta Lacks, for instance, talking about the black female bodies. Now, I want to add a little more to this conversation before we go to, again, the proposal, because again, Philip is not only criticizing something, he also bringing an alternative, which we should really think about. Um, and I want to say, you know, when I started to use the term uh, human animal, I also had to face my own consciousness about the history of, of gender and, uh, and sexism in relation to, you, uh, to animal. Because again, in the history of Western thought, uh, the, the female was considered much more animal than the male. Again, even think of someone like Linnaeus, he term, uh, his term, um, he, he came with two terms, homo sapiens and mammals. And mammals connected to the mammary glands that he connected specifically to nursing, uh, so specifically to females, was what kept us in connection to non-human animals. Mm. While again, the, the intellectual aspect to know was again a specific male aspect connected to Aristotle and Greek thinking, logos, male. Eh? So again, I, I had to, again, place myself again also in this critique. Again, I guess it's a little different because in the history of the, U the United States, uh, the civil rights movement is literally like yesterday, not even yesterday, eh, 60 years ago. Uh, so the idea that uh, the scar is still very much open. Uh, in the case, for instance, of, uh, uh, of the, the, the example that I pose is something a little more come from the history of ideas, of course, that embed you know, the, the, the history of, of uh, humanity. 
But I did, you know, have to ask myself the question when I started to use the, the term. And I found it uh, still uh, disruptive of uh, something that we take for granted, which is, again, human supremacy. Uh, you know, personally, I'm a vegetarian, but, you know, the idea that we can think of, we can kill animals for leisure, we can kill them for, uh, for food, even if we don't, we don't need to, because one thing, if you're hungry and you're, you know, in the wild, and one thing, if you are not hungry and you don't need, don't need to kill animals. Furthermore, you know, all the violence done in, in animal farming and inhumane conditions. So when I went to that level, I felt that it was disrupting of uh, what our society still take for granted, which is uh, human supremacy. Again, uh, yeah, we still live in a very racist, uh, sexist, uh, ableist, uh, ethnocentric society, but at least people know what is racism or what is sexism. They are aware of that. With anthropocentrism, most people don't even know what you're talking about. When you're talking about human supremacy, most people don't even realize what are the premises of that, because our society takes anthropocentrism for granted. So when I re realized that, I thought that, again, the, 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 the reason that I was using that, it was very much needed now, which again might be different 20 years from now when people are aware of our supremacy as a species and we criticize that in a generative way like you're doing. You criticize something, you bring other options. But again, that was my own uh, response to that. But I like, again, your response is like, yeah, no, maybe we don't need the term. Maybe we, we need another term. So one question I have is, how do you feel again about uh, really uh, make a claim about anthropocentrism or if you feel that we need to do that? Because again, that's very posthumanist. Transhumanists don't care about that. Transhumanists are totally fine with anthropocentrism, but I'm a posthumanist. So I want to ask you, what is your position on anthropocentrism? And then the second question, of course, I want to go a little more into your proposal, which is very fascinating about human entity instead of, or non-human entity instead of uh, human animal or non-human animal. So let's say, I guess, with the first question, anthropocentrism, what is your position about that? And then we move on to the next one. Sure, so no, I think that's an excellent question. So I, I think that, I, I, I think anthropocentrism is, is, is very, in a very real way almost uh, inextricably entangled with humanism as it had written. So any particular mention of anthropocentrism is gonna be connected to kind of rational humanism, enlightenment humanism. And that's, I think that's part of the reason why um, it's, I think it's important to even when we, that term itself, human animal, is still, it still looks at that term animal from a human perspective. And so it, it, it doesn't necessarily do away with the anthropocentric uh, uh, formation or dominance because it still places human and animal side by side. And I think I mentioned a little bit in there in terms of my critique, like are we, well, which, which animal are we, right? Mm -hmm. are, are, are we gonna be a part of Linnaeus' cartography? Are we gonna be, uh, like, which, where do we fit? And, and if, are we still kind of trying to find animals in response to our own specific uh, location, right? Because we can't know what a dolphin thinks. We've never been a dolphin. We can't know what a cat thinks. Mm -hmm. We've never been a cat. And so in, for, in order for us to, again, to project our connection to the animals, we try to place ourselves next to them, but it doesn't necessarily deal with what, what they are. And so mm -hmm. I, I think it still becomes an incomplete descriptor in terms of how we begin to wrestle with our own relationship with nature and our own understanding of what anthropocentrism has done to us and not let alone to, to, to nature itself, which is part of, I think, the reason why it's important for us to go even beyond that uh, into the entity piece. Because an entity, and, and, and it, it has, the, again, it has this kind of hyper, hyper object kind of space, right? Or at the very least, it gives us a recognition that we are both subject and object, that we are very, that our own vantage point, our own perspective, our own location, our own embodiment is something that's very very important at the same time as an entity we are part of a we are a small part of a very uh, of a very large cosmos of a, of a very distinct uh, biosphere right of, of communities and so forth and so it, entities give us the capacity to recognize that we are part of something else a human animal says we're part of nature uh, but it still places us against against nature in some ways because we're defining nature against our, against humanity but entity places us as something that is integral to like matter as in some ways so it, it, in, in some ways when people talk about genetics not necessarily being that far off although last year I don't know if you've uh, you've seen this uh, this uh, this article uh, or this further research where they looked at the African pan genome and and said that it has at least ten percent more ten <laughs> percent more um, base pairs than the reference genome, which and so the the 
essentially the, the the authors were suggesting that we need to make more we need to make more reference genomes that are specific to 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 regions in the world but I, I digress the idea is that if we look at it from an entity entity perspective it gives us something that is a bit more tangible a bit more material but it also kind of flattens this idea of human supremacy uh, because the human entity is still not it's 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 placing humanity against what an entity is not placing humanity against what an animal is and it's not placing non-human um, non-human entities against against uh, against it's humans or man again. It's placing non-human entities about what non-human um, forms of embodiment against what an entity is. And so, as an entity, we now function in a very real, relative space, and we have a, a very serious kind of sociality that requires us to to um, to reimagine and imagine new ways for us to uh, be together right now, but also kind of in the future. And so, it's, for me, I think that the human entity gives us a way to actually a way out of of this kind of uh, humanocentric or um, anthropocentric and kind of a human supremacist uh, space uh, because it doesn't even reference that we're not the reference point anymore the entity is thank you so much philip and the last question before we move on to our uh, second interview is uh, a critique that was ready from the 50 kangile is there a risk of losing biology when you switch to physics for instance if you go into the human entity do you risk of losing again the biological aspect and the connection again to our again uh, material biological embodiment. No, no, I think that's an excellent question, right? And so, but I think, but I think, and, and so the empiricist in me wants to say that uh, biology is a very hard science, right? But the posthumanist in me wants to say that biology is still a metaphysical framework that we that we determine to make meaning of what we've what we've recognized as chemicals right and electrical impulses and muscular frameworks right that and so we we're, we're still placing meaning atop of these uh, these descriptors to help us understand what it is for us to have a heart a beating heart while we're not thinking about having a beating heart and so there is like a space in between when we talk about emergence or emerging properties right where we have a body but now we have a consciousness and we we i think we i think it may be safe in this space, maybe not in others, to argue that there's a very real connection between our physical body and the emergent properties that that result. But the fact, that, but the idea is that these emergent properties have a very real, a very real space in between the physical the physical aspects that we still have a level of mystery around. And so the mysterious component, it, in some ways, becomes the ways in which we interpret what we see, right, in terms of observation. And so the and so. I may have I may have left the building for a second, but I'll bring it back <laughs> by by suggesting this uh, that the entity recognizes that the hum the entity at the end of human recognizes that it's the human entity, and so that the human entity goes along with all of the biology that is relevant to a human. And so when we talk about human physiology, human neurochemistries, human muscular uh, skeletal um, uh, formations. We recognize that that is specific to a human entity. Similar when we go back to the Doberman Pinscher example, a Doberman Pinscher uh, entity, all of that goes into what what makes up a Doberman Pinscher. Now, some people may, you know, again, there's a lot of genetic similarities between us and, and everything around us, but but nevertheless, the biological framework is held within the uh, the, the the first part of these these new terms: human entity, dog entity, right, uh, cat entity, so on and so forth, because you cannot be those things. And, and, and not be something else at the same time. I mean, aside from like maybe a cultural, like a, catch, a cultural cat, a domestic cat versus wild cat, you know, these kind of things. But nevertheless, the idea is that the biology is very much grounded within uh, what, we, what we have at least historically known these entities to have been. Thank you so much, Philip. So, of course, there is much more to talk about. <laughs> this is why we're going into a second interview with Philip. Yeah. <laughs> so, first of all, thank you again so much. Philip Butler is a visiting assistant professor at the Theological Studies Department at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. So, if you want to study with him or if you want to know more about his work, please check him online. Also, we want to thank again the beautiful artwork we have on the background by the artist Art by Ancient. You can again check uh, this artist who is very visionary and very, very inspiring on Instagram. And we are going to move on again to the Second topic, so here we have talked about uh, the notion of human animal as the constructed by Philip with his proposal of human entity, black participation in posthuman discourse. We are now going on specifically to talk about black post and transhumanism. So again, I'm very excited to go on with our conversation. Thank you so much again, Philip, for coming at NYU uh, to share your wisdom and knowledge about the posthuman discourse. You are very kind. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here, though. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.